Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Liz Charlotte, Director of Communications at the Mississippi State Department of Health. As you all know, Dr. Dan Edney took his post Monday morning early as our new state health officer. Uh, and we both thought it was important that we get together with our Mississippi media colleagues and give you all a chance to meet him and learn a little bit more about the public health direction he's traveling and what Dr. Edney's priority will be during his tenure. So without further ado, good morning, Dr. Edney. How are you doing today? Good morning, Liz. I'm well. How are you? I'm well. Congratulations. We all stand behind you 100%. Look forward to your leadership. Let's start with some of your priorities. Well, thank you, Liz. And, and first of all, I, I really must thank Dr. Thomas Dobbs for everything he has done for the, the state and the agency and uh, certainly for me as a friend, a colleague, and a mentor, uh, he has trained me to do the best job I think I'm going to be able to do, and I appreciate his service very much. I appreciate the Board of Health and Chairman Th Dr. Thad Waits for giving me the opportunity to serve in this capacity, and everybody's been so gracious and kind. I'm, I'm truly grateful for that. You know, it, it is an honor to serve as a state health officer, but it's very much a unique professional challenge, certainly for me. And I look at it as a professional challenge to be able to, to serve the people in this capacity is, a, in my opinion, a, a high calling indeed. You know, I've, I love being a physician in Mississippi. I was born in Mississippi, grew up in the Mississippi Delta, had my education uh, in Mississippi, medical school at the University of Mississippi. Went to internal medicine residency at the University of Virginia, but knew I was coming home. And in 1991, came to Vicksburg as a young general internist and set up shop and have loved being a physician there for 31 years. So it took a lot to get me uh, away from the practice that I love, the patients that I love. Uh, but this is a, a unique challenge, and I felt the, the calling to do it. And, you know, now that as I leave private practice, I'm very excited to engage in my new public practice and to look after the health care issues and certainly the public health issues of now 2.9 million Mississippi patients with the population of our state. I take that responsibility quite seriously. And why in the world would I do this? And it very simply, I have felt the need to be a catalyst for change. Since 1991, throughout my entire practice life, Mississippi has been at the bottom of virtually every healthcare indicator and at the top of virtually every health disparity issue that impacts the various populations of our state. And as a physician, I'm just tired of seeing it. Um, I'm embarrassed as a physician that my service uh, to West Mississippi and the South Delta has not moved the needle. Um, I'm embarrassed that we continue with these numbers and realistically, I, I see little evidence of improvement. We have improved some, in some areas that I, I will share with you, but by and large, we're pretty much where we've always been. And I just don't believe that's where we need to stay or where we have to stay. Let me show you the data. And, and be able to show you in real life terms what we are up against. I apologize, I had this ready to go. And Liz, now I'm, I'm not seeing, here it is. Okay, we're, we're gonna get that yeah. up for you, Dr. Adney. Can you see it, Liz? No, can, we can't see it. I think we're gonna come and get that up for you. Um, in the meantime, why don't we talk a little bit about health equity issues? Well, and that's what we'll 
will show with this. And regrettably, with all of the indicators that we look at, we just see that we're still struggling mightily in the obesity battle. We're struggling mightily with the impact of diabetes and hypertension, stroke and heart disease with throughout our, our population. Uh, we are seeing an escalation in deaths related to opioid overdoses. And for me, the most egregious part is that you know, we still lead the nation in maternal infant mortality. So these are issues that are of great importance and that you know, we need to continue to attack. You know, the, I just refuse to accept the premise. I've said this before, I will continue to say it, that I just refuse to accept the premise that we have to be last and every healthcare indicator and have such struggles with health disparities. I just refuse to accept the fact that it's our fate to be the unhealthiest population in the nation. You know, I refuse to believe that our teenagers and college age students must continue to uh, die at an escalating rate of opioid overdoses. It's getting worse, not better. And the most egregious of at all of all of it is I refuse to believe that our mothers and babies are just fated to continue to die at the highest rate in the nation. And this, you know, we're talking about white mothers and black mothers. We're talking about white babies and black babies. All of us are dying at higher rates than the rest of the nation. But what's absolutely egregious is the fact that our black mothers are dying at three times the rate of the rest of the nation. The, um, these issues are difficult, but they're solvable. Here's your map, Dr. Adney. So here's the data, and I apologize for the delay, but this is important to see and to see why change can't wait, why we must move Mississippi out of last place. It, this is a, a graph showing where we rank among the nation from the Commonwealth Group's uh, annual report on, on overall health care and health care disparities in the nation. And to the left of the graph, as I'm looking at it, you see you know, the healthiest populations. And we're looking at you know, Massachusetts and Maryland and Pennsylvania, Connecticut. Obviously very different areas of the country than Mississippi, different populations. But as you move further to the right, you see the numbers decline steadily and we get all the way to the right and you see Wyoming, West Virginia, Oklahoma, you look at 48th, 49th, and then there we are, Mississippi, yet again, 50th. But Liz, what got my attention was we were, we're 50th by a mile. It, it, you just see a horrible drop off. We fall off the cliff from 49th to 50th. And this is measuring things, uh, various healthcare indicators in terms of healthcare outcomes. It also looks at health disparity issues, uh, social determinants of health and how they impact our populations. It also looks at access to care issues and, and the utilization, the proper utilization of the healthcare system. And all of those measures together put us in last place. And if you see, all of our populations are below the all group median. So Caucasians, African-Americans are both well below the national median. Hispanics, Asians, Native American numbers are too small to show on this study, but I suspect that we're all in the same boat. So all of us as Mississippians are in that group. It's not just some of us, it's all of us. And because of that, you know, it's imperative that we continue to pay attention to this and that we take up this challenge to uh, be a benefit to the people of Mississippi. 
So it's, Dr. Dr. Edney, let's talk a little bit. Um, I know the, this is, these are your priorities. We know that certain things will impact people's health. First of all, getting them healthy, giving everyone access to healthcare, and then granting them the tools so that they can get screenings and they can uh, understand their health education and, and utilize the tools available. And how do you, how do you think we can accomplish that? Well, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be all hands on deck. But Liz, I think we look at other examples of success in the state. First of all, let's look at education. Uh, we've done a wonderful job in our state. We were 50th for a, as long as I could remember. But with the leadership of the governor and, the, and legislative leadership, the Department of Education, and an agreed upon significant investment uh, financial resources from the citizens, we have moved well up the list and to the mid 30s, I believe. So we're not just, we're not at the bottom anymore. If we did it in education, we can do it in health as well. Uh, we've done it to a large degree with cardiovascular disease, with our STEMI system of care that's a public private partnership. We're now in Mississippi, if you call 911 with chest pain and it looks like you're having a heart attack, the system of care will direct you immediately to the closest hospital that can intervene to save your life. No more going to the closest hospital and losing time. It's getting us where we need to be the best place as fast as possible. That's making a difference. That's saving lives. It worked. Uh, we had success during COVID. This is actually an example is of where we had a health disparity win. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Dr. Dobbs saw that our black population was being disproportionately impacted by COVID, that we were having higher uh, death rates among African-American Mississippians. And he was one of the few state health officers to say, we're not gonna accept this. And with the leadership, with his leadership and leadership of our equity team under Dr. Victor Sutton, uh, we went out and engage the community to see what the problems were, to listen to them, uh, to listen to their suggestions of solutions, partnered with them, provided the resources they needed. And the outcome, Liz, was that we went from being worst in the nation with Black COVID outcomes to having the highest rate of vaccination among African-Americans of any state in the country and totally turned the morbidity and mortality of black Mississippians around uh, to where now you know, they are having some of the best outcomes from COVID in our state. That was because public health cooperated with uh, the communities to get the job done. I believe we can do this with maternal and infant mortality. I believe we can use the same strategies and develop the partnerships that we need to determine what the solutions are. They will be different all around the state. The needs in the Delta are very different from the Gulf Coast. They have different problems that require different solutions and different resources, but we have to be willing to go engage the communities, listen and work together. It's gonna to mean that we have to have cooperation with our political leadership, which I know that we will. There's gonna to need to be interagency cooperation among state agencies, and I'm already seeing that. There's gonna to have to be cooperation with the academic world. Uh, we need to leverage our public-private partnerships that we developed during COVID, because we will need those resources. We'll need every public health partner that we can find, both state and federal. Uh, and we will need to engage community uh, leadership, community groups, nonprofits, the faith-based community and their leadership. It truly is going to require all hands on deck if we want to do this. And I truly believe that Mississippians do not want to see our folks dying at a higher rate than the rest of the nation, and certainly not our mothers and babies. Uh, and Dr. Edney, I've known you now for a couple years, and uh, you have stressed to me that health equity in all programs and all offices 
is going to it's going to have to permeate every single program and every single office in this agency and also of course you stress the infant and maternal mortality um, but you've also you have a background in addictionology and you've also talked about the surging crisis with opioids yes and we actually were seeing some improvement before the covid pandemic hit us but since to 2019, we've had a steady escalation again to our highest numbers of opioid deaths in the nation. Last year, being you know, topping over 105,000 deaths, and these are preventable deaths, and they're mainly deaths now of young people from heroin and fentanyl. And we had uh, around 600 Mississippi young people die last year. I think we'll have worse numbers this year, and that's uh, a unique public health challenge that that we're taking on. You know, Liz, we're rolling out programs that I think will impact. Uh, we're looking at leveraging our telemedicine capabilities within the agency to expand access to care for Mississippians who right now don't have access to care. Uh, and those who are suffering from alcohol and drug addiction need, need access to care. And as providers of last resort, you know, we're gonna help uh, open the door to improve that access. Uh, with the maternal infant mortality, we're rolling out the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies program, which will, is a nurse case management in-home program to assist those uh, pregnant moms through their pregnancy, make sure that they're getting the care they need, make sure that the, that the health disparities that have been getting in the way are moved out of the way to the best of our ability, and watch out for those moms as long as we can in the postpartum period, which is a dangerous period for women in Mississippi, and to watch out for those babies and make sure that they're getting the care that they need and, the, and that they deserve. Just two examples of you know, programmatic changes that I think will help move the needle on these disparity numbers. And yes, the expectation within the agency, you know, I put the highest level of accountability on ourselves. It starts with me, uh, I'm accountable, but every uh, leader in this agency and each member of their team will be held accountable that we will do everything that we can to improve these health disparity numbers so that Mississippi moves out of last place. Because Liz, it's worth it. It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be difficult. It's not gonna happen right away, but it's gonna be worth it because every, every point on the needle of improvement with these health indicators that we see will mean real Mississippi lives saved. It'll mean real Mississippians who aren't suffering from the ravages of diabetes and hypertension and, and heart disease. Uh, these will be real lives. And it's gonna mean a, a brighter future you know, for our children and our grandchildren. And Liz, as a Mississippian, as a physician, and certainly as the state health officer, this is, this is something that I have to push for. Yeah, you. Um, I've been here a long time, and it is disheartening. There's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons that we are in that place, and we know what the reasons are. And like you said, we did a lot during COVID. And also, the other thing I've seen we that we do a lot here now is we listen to communities and let them tell us what they need in emergencies. And I think also in non-emergencies, we are working very difficult with collaborations and partnerships. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. That's, you know, lessons learned. You know, the, the things that, that work, we need to leverage. The things that didn't work, we need to get rid of. You know, continue to do the, the same old things over and over and over again and expecting to come out of last place is in true insanity. But, you know, Liz, I'm not the first state health officer to care about this or to work up or to work on this. I mean, going back to Dr. Cobb and certainly Dr. Ed Thompson, Dr. Mary Courier and, and Dr. Dobbs, all of our health officers have been fighting against these numbers. The I have the benefit of many lessons already haven't been learned through other uh, health crises of the state. And, and now us having partnerships that we've never had before and having some resources that, that we haven't had before. So now it's, I think the ball is teed up for us to do something about it. The, those who've gone before us have done a lot of heavy lifting and I'm grateful to be standing on a firm foundation to be able to try to accomplish this. 
I think you're the eighth state health officer. I have to go back and count because we didn't always have state health officers like back in the 19th or whenever we started the Board of Health. But we have some questions. I'm going to put on my specs so I can see. Let's see, this is from Kobe Vance, um, Dr. Edney, he's with MPB. Dr. Edney discussed how the state can use the methodology from the pandemic to help treat disparities in the black community. And he plans on seeing if those tools can help reduce infant mortality. Are there any specific examples of how the Department of Health could conduct community outreach to address disparities? I, I think, why don't we talk about address those disparities? And I think the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies program is a great example. Absolutely. And I'm uh, Dr. Victor Sutton, who's the department head for our preventive health and health equity department. And I met yesterday um, and he understands that the equity team is front and center on all of our issues. There's, this is not a single program that we administer that doesn't have to deal with health disparities. And so our equity team will be at the table making sure that we don't have blind spots, helping us overcome implicit bias that's part of human nature and certainly a part of our society, but make sure it's not within the agency. And as we are you know, working with partners that we're not encountering it, um, but to, to use those lessons learned, like I said, you know, the first step will be going into the community and listening and partnering. Now, you know, Again, it's going to be different communities will have different problems and different social determinants of health. You know, impoverished whites have, you know, strong implicit bias and health disparities. The African-American community, the, um, our Hispanic community has a different set of issues. Our Native American, it's just every community has different problems and needs different answers and different resources. So I'm not going to sit here and and declare to everybody that I know the answers and this is what we must do, but I will declare that we're gonna do exactly what we did in COVID that was so successful and, uh, and grow out of those lessons of success, grow those partnerships and try to continue to develop those partnerships because it's gonna take all of us. But I promise you that the Mississippi State Department of Health is gonna do its part. And I, you brought up a couple good points too. At-risk populations, there's a lot of them. It's not just racial, it's not just ethnicity. There's people that we have to make sure we address health literacy and that people understand the information that we're giving them. So I, I liked how you went through that. It's not just race, it's not just ethnicity. There's a lot of uh, areas when you talk in at-risk populations. Explain implicit bias, because I think a lot of people might not understand what implicit bias is. Implicit bias is, is part of the human condition. It's, it's something we have to work against. And it's where um, we have biases against groups or people or types of people, uh, you know, based on previous experiences or, or how we were raised or in areas that we grew up. Um, but typically, it's a blind spot. It's implicit that it is there, that the bias is there, but usually individuals don't know they had it. I, I certainly have experience with it and had to come to the realization, you know, some nine, 10 years ago of implicit bias that I didn't think I had that I absolutely did and had to overcome. And I tell people, I didn't learn this lesson at the health department. I came to the health department because I learned this lesson and we all have implicit biases and, and they just get in the way of proper health care. I have women who, uh, pregnant women who are uh, addicted to opioids who are trying so hard to be good mothers. And I hear time and time, you know, I know the fight that they've been through. I know the hard work that they're doing you know, to stay clean and sober. And yet when they go to the hospital, no matter what race they are, they're treated less than because of the disease of addiction. And they're treated as bad mothers. And I hear that story over and over after they, after they deliver their babies and, and would come back to me and it, it would break my heart because I knew what kind of women they were, how courageous they were, but the healthcare system had a bias against them because of the disease of addiction. And, it, and so that just multiplies throughout every disparity that, that we deal with. So it, it's, 
that's not something that's going to change today. But I think if we start the conversation and, you know, we're honest with ourselves and we all want to be, you know, good people and, and good individuals. And, you know, with, you know, as a man of faith, I, I, it's imperative that I recognize my shortcomings and try to overcome them. And I, I challenge all of us to do that. And um, you have done a great job. I, I wanted to just tie this up by saying too, I, I've seen it with people who are poor, my si like my sister, we help her, but I've seen how she's been treated in the healthcare system, not here, but um, it, there are so many different implicit biases. Courtney Ann Jackson from WLBT, she says, I see that at least one high school that started last week has already moved to virtual because of a high number of COVID cases. Is there a concern that once again, we may see more schools forced to do the same as they return amid heightened case numbers? And then she asks a follow-up, any updated guidance? And all right, let's take the first question and the updated guidance we've been sending people to the CDC. So address that first part of the question, if you would. So definitely, Courtney, we do have, you know, concern. It's we've gone through this Omicron BA5 wave. It thankfully was not a spike, but it's been a sustained wave. So we've had a large number of cases, still seeing about 1,400 cases that are being reported to us a day, which means, I mean, how, who knows how many home tests are positive. Ooh. Um, the best indicator we have, though, Liz, is watching hospitalizations and, and deaths. Uh, those are solid indicators that, that are irrespective of, of testing. Hospitalizations are still higher than, than they were, but the healthcare system's handling it. It's not escalating out of control, thankfully. The death rate is staying about five per day, which is five way too many. And we were, you know, for a couple of weeks, we're down to zero deaths a day but we're staying at about five, but it's not escalating, but it's not going down yet. But Dr. Byers told me this morning that um, it looks like we may be starting to see the first evidence of, of a decline. So I, I'm optimistic that the numbers will cool off and uh, as school is getting started, maybe we'll be able to, to push ahead. You know, our community immunity levels are so high now between it, those of us who are vaccinated and up to date like you and I are, um, and those who um, have, are recently have recovered from COVID, you know, we're not in the same situation we were two years ago when no one had any protection. Um, and we're just having to learn to, to live in, in this new environment. We can't predict what the fall is going to hold, but we do see uh, new boosters on the horizon. There's a brand new uh, vaccine Novavax that's FDA approved and um, and it's uh, it's not a messenger RNA vaccine it's more of a traditional protein based vaccine so you know it's another choice people have and it's just as successful it works just as well as the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines do um, so we just really encourage folks you know get your kids vaccinated um, keep your family up up to date. Just give them all the protection they can, so that we can have a successful school year in the in the schoolroom, in the classroom, which is where we want our kids. And especially those that are immunosuppressed or, you know, have chronic diseases and they do get ill, they need to take advantage of the oral antiviral, you know, the antivirals and the monoclonal um, antibodies that are out there as well. We have a question from Michaela Franklin. Oh, so Courtney, and like I said, as far as updated guidance, we are referring everybody to the CDC at this point. This next question is from Michaela Franklin from WAPT. Will the increase in monkeypox affect the school flow as we see Mississippians return to the classrooms this month? Dr. Eddie, first of all, explain to people how you get monkeypox and what we're seeing right now, and I think that'll help answer. Yeah, monkeypox is spread by mainly by direct skin to skin contact, usually intimate contact. Doesn't have to be sexual, but it's usually intimate. You know, at least hugging, uh, you know, sharing a bed. Uh, it, you you can't. There is a respiratory component if you're close enough for a sustained amount of time. Uh, kind of like the chicken pox is spread. They you can get it from bed clothes, uh, but it's you know right now the we're, our focus is on our, our high risk population uh, that 
where we're vaccinating those who are close contacts to uh, individuals who have documented monkeypox or those who are at higher risk. And that's in our uh, gay men population, uh, bisexual, transgender, HIV positive are at risk. And we're really deploying our vaccine in that area. Uh, so in terms of, of the school, it you know, we're working hard for it not to spill over. And uh, so I really think our kids are not at risk. They're certainly at no risk right now. And anyone who's in a monogamous sexual relationship, uh, who's not having in intimate contact with with others, is at you know very very low risk. So you know right now the you know Dr. Paul Byers and our epidemiology team has a great strategy to protect those at higher risk, and we are watching this very closely. We're now up to six cases uh, in the state, but it's not exploding, um, and I think you know we have a, a good plan to try to contain it as much as we can. Yeah, I think it's important because I have gotten a lot of these questions too from reporters. It's it's not transmitted the same way as COVID is. Um, and so it really should not. There are two different types of diseases and it, 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 monkeypox should yeah. Yeah, You're should. not gonna get monkeypox at Walmart. You could get COVID. No. Walmart, but that is not. exactly right. I okay, now, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Edney. Did you have something else to answer? And they won't be getting it at school. Okay, now the next questions, and there's several, deal with uh, abortion. And I do tell reporters for the most part that they need to talk to the attorney general's office. Our only role in this whole lawsuit was to, our, Dr. Dobbs' name was used because he is the executor of the agency that regulated the abortion facility. But I'll go ahead and read them, Dr. Edney, and we'll take them one at a time, okay? And this is again, Will Stribling, and he is asking, what abortion laws does the health department believe it are in effect now that Roe is overturned? Dr. Edney? Well, the trigger law that's been on the books in Mississippi that basically outlaws all abortions except in the uh, case of endangering the mother's life and health and, and instances of rape. Uh, I believe the attorney general has you know, has certified that law, but I would refer those with specific questions to the attorney general. But uh, the issue from our standpoint, in terms of mother's life and health, uh, is, it is our belief that that is, should be, that it is and should be at the discretion of the treating physician to define that and to implement that. That's right, and it, yeah, yes, that's exactly right. Now, um, I don't like to speculate, and so does Dr. Edney anticipate a role for the department? We're in a standby mode right now. Um, there's a lot going on, and so at this point, we're not going to address any any questions having to do what we would collect, will collect, that sort of thing. Um, I think you know, again, and I stress this. Lynn Fitch at the Attorney General's office needs to talk to you all about this. Um, the, the AG's office is the one who brought the lawsuit. So um, are we conducting any planning or analysis related to the likelihood that the end of legal abortion brings more, more births with more high-risk pregnancies and more babies with spe uh, specific needs after they're born? That is a great question for yeah. our legislature and Lynn Fitch. Yes, and I, I, you know, from our standpoint, mm -hmm. um, we do expect increased needs among uh, women that may be carrying higher risk pregnancies than they would have before. Um, and, and we do have you know, specific administration of programs that are directed towards children with special needs. And, uh, and those are some of our, in my opinion, some of our most important yeah. programs. And we will be advocating for you know, full funding of those programs to, to take care of these moms and, and their babies. Um, and I just think we have an obligation to help these pregnant moms to have the best outcome that they can have and not have to worry, are they gonna be a statistic and be one of those maternal deaths? And, you know, and that means we got to take care of them after they have the baby. You know, we can't have a woman with pregnancy induced hypertension on four medications, barely controlled, lose her Medicaid at the second month and then have no access to care and have no access to medication. That, that just doesn't make any sense to me as a physician. Um, you know, I think there are answers to these that, you know, that we can 
look at, but we do have to recognize that this problem is real. We need to address yeah. And I think you have, we do have a lot of programs for women and children um, in our health services area and in our preventive health, but we have WIC, Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies. Um, we have prenatal high risk management. So we have a lot going on, but you have boldly also stated, and I say boldly because it is bold, that we need to look beyond two months. We need to expand access to health care and to funding. Yeah. I I think it's, the, I've said before, I, I think it's expanding postpartum coverage with Medicaid for much further than two months. And, and we can debate whether it has to be 12 months. We can debate does it have to be every woman if they have a normal healthy pregnancy. Those are things we can talk about, but to cut all women off who are otherwise ineligible after the second month, I think is, is very risky for us with a as a state that already has the highest maternal right. mortality. We're just asking for it to be worse you know, not better. It's the easiest thing we can do. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We have a lot more to do other than that. And I uh, have a question from JTV, WJTV, Jaylene. Um, are there any plans of using a public health approach to address gun violence, specifically in low-income communities across the state? I was just talking to Dr. Sutton about that yesterday and saying, don't you see this as a major public health issue? You know, the American Medical Association has identified it as a major public health issue, and and using, you know, when you say using public health approaches, that means using the data and using using evidence based methods, which is what we do at, at the health department. So when I'm talking about, you know, policies, it, it's not politics; it's evidence based policy. You know, I'm I'm basically presenting the science as as we know it and. So any issue impacting the public health that we're speaking on will be based on the evidence. And so, you know, understanding the evidence is the first thing. And then looking at the best ways to improve outcomes based on the evidence. And that's going to be true for gun violence. Thank you, Dr. Eddie. It does not look like we have any more questions. Let me take one more look. Oh. Yes, we do. All right, Courtney Ann is asking from WLBT, is there a threshold for number of cases of monkeypox when MSDH would start sharing the counties where it's identified? I just took a call from a news director last night about this and explained to him, because he had heard rumors that there was a case in Vicksburg, that environmentally, this is not really, it's, it's not like West Nile virus or easy transmission like COVID. What are your thoughts on identifying counties, Dr. Edney? Yeah, right now it doesn't really provide any useful data. Most of our cases, or a, a certainly a significant portion of our current cases have been contracted out of state. And we're, and of course, they're, they're in isolation and we're working on containment and then vaccinating close contacts. You know, um, I totally, trust and depend on the expertise of Dr. Paul Byers and, and his team. And I know if it becomes a, you know, a public health need to share that information, we'll be glad to. I think, I hope people understand though, that we're trying to take care of a community right now that's already stigmatized and is hesitant to come forward for help. And so we're trying to make sure that they get the help that they need and also provide the public health containment that we need to do in a way that is non-judgmental, non-stigmatizing uh, to, to get the job done and make sure that people are healthy and safe. Let me, Liz, I gotta give a shout out. This, you know, monkeypox is just another great example of why you have to have a, a health department, why you have to have public health experts, you know, working every day and why we need, you know, epidemiology team like that Dr. Byers leads, uh, you know, the physicians had not even heard of monkeypox six months ago or Bocalderia, you know, I mean, these bugs that keep jumping out at us that, that regular clinicians have never heard of or had to deal with, you know, private doctors depend on us at the health department, you know, to identify these things and to lead them and guide them. And we're very proud to do so. Yeah, we talk about TB, and I always tell reporters, this is what we do every single day. The cornerstone of public health uh, among the regulatory functions is identifying disease and uh, mitigating the spread of it. We have another question from Courtney Ann. 
How has COVID impacted the role of state health officer, particularly considering how public facing it quickly became? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. It, it certainly made it high profile and, that, and that's another uh, gratitude that we all should have for Dr. Dobbs because I, I think he, he brought us through the hurricane of COVID, uh, not just with expertise and professionalism, but I think he did so with grace and wisdom. You know, his job was to sail the ship through the hurricane and bring us out the other side, which he did masterfully. And now my job is to keep sailing the ship in the right direction um, so that we you know, can continue working on the other public health issues of the day as hopefully COVID gets off our back and allows us to do this. You know, I tell people, you know, I, I don't want to be in the news because that's usually not a good thing when the state health officer is in the news. But there are times that we just have to be. And um, where, you know, the the state needs to hear the truth of what public health issues are and what solutions we think are necessary and understand it's based on the evidence, you know. So um, I'm very grateful that in Mississippi that my position is not a political position. It, so your state health officer has the freedom to employ and deploy public health resources based on evidence-based medicine, which is as a physician, and as a just regular citizen is what I want of my, of my health department. Well, Dr. Edney, I, I don't see any other questions here. Um, last quick comment, just give me a, of the most important thing to you right now, quick comment. Well, the most important thing to me right now, my, I'm laser focused on, on really understanding and identifying the health disparity issues that are impacting all of our populations across the state and, and for all of us to have a better understanding of that. And then to come to an agreement of what disparities we're gonna attack first and get after it. We've already started at the health department. We started Monday. Yeah, we have. Well, you've asked us to think about three priorities, all the senior leadership. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Edney. Welcome again. We're excited to have you. It'd be great. And uh, on behalf of Dr. Edney and the Mississippi State Department of Health, I'm Liz Charlotte. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you, Liz.